but, uh, but yes, yeah, so because we ended up working together quite a lot on that series, then we did actually build up more of a relationship. And so by the time we did the Christmas, we filmed the Crimson Horror before we did the Christmas special. And um, by then we knew each other quite well. So we had that lovely sort of uh, bit at the start of the story with um, Strax and the Doctor going around with the memory worm and uh, I've been run up by a cat all that bit. Um, and then by then we knew each other quite well. And certainly the reader we couldn't agree each other because we all sort of laughed at So I always found him to be sort of like very generous and you know, such a ball of energy. Like, I remember like one, one, uh, yeah, when we were doing the memory worm scene, I think he had just come back from doing publicity in New York over the weekend. So he'd been sort of, yeah, he had about two hours sleep. He was still doing full shooting day, but he was absolutely, apart from a couple of times when you can see the energy was dropping, he was just absolutely there and on and whatever. So, yeah, it's quite, yeah, it's, it's good to have a leading man of that who's quite inspirational to go down to people. Um, you told me to first, it wasn't the first scene, it wasn't the first scene. No. The first scene was a scene when our, um, I'm a teenager and my first day penny drops and I really, I, when I'm trying to say that Rory and Eddie fancy each other. That was the first thing I filmed. That wasn't, wasn't that at all. Um, <laughs> so the first scene with Matt would have been in the... Um, I'm sure there was a doll of him in the corner. Yeah, probably. Um, the first scene with Matt was in the uh, Hitler's office. And um, yeah, just like Dan says, a complete ball of energy. Um, but you know, I didn't, honestly, I didn't have, you know, I'm only in 14 minutes of this one episode, and that was filmed over two weeks, which was separated between three months. So, I mean. Yeah, but what are 14 minutes, right? Thank you very much. <laughs> I, I just remember him, him being very welcoming. Like, I just, um, it just, I kind of like to watch him as an artist. And I remember when we were in the TARDIS, and I just shot, actually that was the first scene. We are in the TARDIS, and I shot the TARDIS, and it's shaking about, and we're protecting him, and it's shaking about. And um, I just, like, we, we cut in between scenes, and you could just see his mind ticking over, and what he's gonna do next for the, ne the, the, the next take. And um, that was just, you know, kind of inspiring to see how he creates his work. And did you, did you go into find that he was, because you see that it, it, on the, the news that was coming through was that almost every take was different. Mm. Yeah, yeah, definitely. It was, it was interesting seeing, because I remember I, I, I didn't really have much sort of um, uh, screen time to take attempt. I remember sort of going to the read through from my first episode. Dave was very on it, he almost was completely off book. And so, sort of like, you could tell exactly he made his choices and he was like, him all. And with Matt, it was much more kind of, um, you know, the read-through was just kind of a read-through, just a bit of a play around that sort of thing. And then on set, you could see the different options that he was giving the director the editor. So, uh, there's a bit where he has a confrontation with, what was his name, Third and Runaway, to get the character's name. But sort of like, sometimes when he was absolutely sort of in his face, and other times when he was much more sort of quiet and cold and steely. And it's just, you know, that, that's what you can do with screens, you can't do with theatre. Right? So, a bit of a scene. And uh, Ian, when you first met Matt, was it love at first sight? Uh, yes, he adored me. <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean it was only um, I think it, it, it was only his second uh, outing of, of doing uh, so he was very new to it uh, and quite nervous and but terrifically charming and uh, very welcoming to me just coming in for the first time. Harry Gillen was by his side, and they were both in it together, really, uh, starting out. And like, like you said, it was, it was incredibly interesting to see them perform, because one thing was ne never the same. It was always different. It was always trying something new, with lots of energy, um, tripping them out of invention. You try something, throw them away, try something else, go that way. Um, it was really, really wonderful watching them. And then when I was lucky enough to come in and, and, and join them again for Borrelia uh, River Song, and somehow he had gained enormously in confidence by then, and, and he was a different person, really. Uh, um, both still enormously uh, uh, public work, with still lots of energy, but then somehow calmed down a little bit by the time I worked with him the second time. That's really interesting because in the good old bad old days, they used to film that sequence. The doctor's first story was often the third one shot or something like that. So you're saying that he, uh, to begin with, was experimenting and then found himself, as it were, in the role. Yep. Brilliant. And um, 
when you had uh, met Matt, uh, what were your uh, initial impressions of him as a person rather than an actor? <laughs> I think it's, it's, it's always strange when you're going into when you're not drinking everything, you're also meeting someone for the first time. Then I, I think it's the point of yeah, all, all the actors who play the Doctor I've, I've met have been a good leading man in that respect. The part of the job is actually welcoming sort of the guest artists on set and that sort of thing, making you come from the road as well. Obviously, I mean I was there on Peter Halden's first day, so it was kind of like it was like a bit of a two-way process. Yes. <laughs> we were coming back to it, he was his first day, and it was kind of like, ah, yeah, okay. So we were all sharing things, but it was. Um, yeah, I, I, think, I think that's the impression that I got from it. It was, it was also interesting sort of coming back to because I sort of don't think David Nolte was a very succinct actor and stuff like And you know, it was his program by then. And then going back to it with Matt, because he was sort of younger than me as well, which was a slightly different. So again, it's interesting having all three leads all being younger than you, rather than sort of like Beethoven, Catherine Tate, both of them. So that was, that was a slightly sort of different, different dynamic. But they all seemed to get on with each other, and I think it was just, yeah, it seemed quite a neat collegiate really. So it was, um, yeah, but not with me. No, 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 no. Dina, what happens with you? Yeah, just like he seemed as the other two did. Because I, like I say again, I, I always feel very nervous going into a job that's already got its, I would say cliquey, but it wasn't cliquey. You know, they've got their group, they've got their family. And you're stepping in and you're like, oh, well, how, you know, where do I fit? It's like going to start in school. Every time you get a new job, it's like starting a new school. You're like, oh, where do I fit in? And um, they were all just very welcoming. I remember just kind of respecting his, um, just his openness to every single person, which I think every actor should have, but every single person on in, in in the piece, so let's say the camera guys, the people, um, the makeup artists, the costume guys, the people who are serving me the food in the day, like, it was just kind of like, that's my mate, they're my family, bring them all in. So I got that sense from them completely. For them, was, was, that, was that a similar experience to uh, we have a long running soap opera and you make all these letters that he was also in? No, it wasn't. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's not my first job, so I, I, I've had a very, very good team. Honestly, quite an experience, but um, you need to be in a family, and I was in it for nine months, and I had, uh, yeah, I didn't change my life, got me more jobs, <laughs> but it was um, it was tough when I was young going that one, but you know, very grateful for doing it. The doctor was friendly. Yeah, and also I had, I guess I had a bit more. I have a few. Some more balls. What should you say? Some more balls? That's what you said? Yeah, well, I'm not going to do Ten of them. No, I am. Um, yeah, so I. Yeah, I, I was just a, a lot more grounded as a, a, an actress and a woman um, and just coming on set and kind of, it was still daunting, but before I kind of like, that person didn't say hello to me. Okay, I'll go sit in my dressing room. Like, um, and that wasn't the case. They were very welcoming. Um, but they had the, uh, the, the three together had an enormous energy. Like you'd be doing something, cut, and then they'd roll in the mouth on the floor somewhere doing something. <laughs> All three of them together. Like, oh, okay. It was funny. Yeah. And Ian. Yeah. Um, I, there was one particular day when I I came in and um, uh, um, Karen got to tell me the story, but the night before. Uh, she'd been at home and she suddenly got a phone call from Matt and, and Matt said, Go on, tell her, tell her the television, tell, tell her it's why you need one now. God, God, this is the piece. At least he's on television. He's in Ace Ventura when nature calls. You've got to see it. <laughs> and so the next day I tell her, but I'm a movie star. And they're all over me because I've been in a movie with Jim Carrey. It was very sweet, I have to say. They are trying to make God. More impressed that I've been in some, you know, dreadful thing with Jim Carrey. A legend. A legend. A legend. Yes, I will answer the question what was Jim Carrey like? A freaking nightmare. He was absolutely out there 100%. There's something that happens when you go on a set and. Uh, Big movies like these take a long time in between. There's lighting, 
lighting setups go on for two, three hours while they tend to like turn around and do something. And most people who tie with their trailers, where they've got a master or they've got a chef cooking for them or looking after them or banning them down. Or, you know, just, but that happens all the time on Doctor Who, though, right? All the time. <laughs> Jim Carrey stays on the set and entertains the troops. <laughs> you'll be doing stand-up, you'll do funny walks, you'll do straight out of Monty Python, and he's just entertained the troops because he cannot be still. He is on it 24 hours a day. And, uh, I worked with him for four months, but uh, I've got no idea what he's like as a person. <laughs> but he's very funny, I tell you that. Would well, you make a good doctor? I think make an excellent dog. <laughs> Why don't I give him a call now? <laughs> Jim Carrey, everyone. <laughs> so, if you've been cast, if you've been on set, what was, what was your best memory of doing your story? Ooh, um, it's funny actually, because I have done some times with the I mean, it's that whole weird thing of the whole aesthetic experience. Um, which is quite extreme in terms of getting up before five o'clock, getting glued into the suit for three hours. And also we were on location for my first scene, which, 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 which Matt wasn't necessarily in, but it was a whole thing of having some two bits of very, very similar dialogue in two consecutive scenes and trying to fluff it. Because, you know, there were two ones like, I hope, I look forward to crashing you on the, I look forward to meeting you on the field and back on the ranch, I'll crash the life in your work that you went for. There were two lines quite similar to that, but the one of them, there was an explosion time kick off in the background that took about half an hour to set up. And so I just remember that kind of thing of just getting tongue tied. I wouldn't crush the thing up and then hearing this explosion going on. The entire crew would go, what? That's it's fine. It's another half an hour. We packed the tissue. So it was, um, yeah, we were in an industrial, we were a brickworks on sort of like about 20 minutes out of target, so it was quite an industrial space. So I remember, I remember that being very high stakes that first day back of going, oh god, because it was also, I haven't got the script for, this is a great character, this could be really fun. So obviously I didn't want to screw it up either, because potentially this thing, as Strax did, it became a very popular character as well. But that was the time, the last time I felt that real, you know, my heart hammering, it's like, don't, don't get the line right, get the line right. So it was, um, yeah, that was my first day back when I did my go to And then after that, we were doing sort of night shooting for that, so we were sort of uh, an aircraft hangar, again, sort of about 30, 30 miles out of the car. And we were doing all this, um, yeah, about 3 o'clock in the morning, morning in an aircraft hangar. I've got a rubber head on, which I can't hear through anyway, but then an aircraft hangar, because it's massive, the acoustics were bizarre. So because we're all sort of in different parts of it, we were trying to say lines of dialogue, no one could hear each other. So it was, it was a really odd shoot, and then there was one more point where, where I think I've told the story already before, but I, I walked a bit too heroically for my rubber trousers and uh, the crotch splits. And, and then all of a sudden, the prosthetics team, emergency pit stop, I had sort of about five people from Millennium Effects kneeling in front of me with car paint and copied X glue, gluing my groin back together. <laughs> <laughs> the first trousers, they're, 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 they're just not very, they, they tear very easily. So that's, just, that's one of those things where, you know, as an actor, you have to have a nice, healthy sense of the absurd. And I think that was definitely the exercise in that moment. <laughs> Again, mine's got that excited, and mine's not that excited. Um, you know, so, most memorable moment, I suppose, is stepping into the target for the first time and just seeing. Had you watched it before? No, I knew of it. A research? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, like, I, 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 like, no. Um, so, I, I hadn't watched it before, and I, I, I had when I was younger. I got freaked out by the dialogues when I was about four and I never watched it again. Um, it's alright, you got to kill a few later on after you changed the palette things. Yes, yeah, it's all cool. There we go. Um, so, yeah, just kind of stepping into the TARDIS for the first time and, and just that kind of sense of this is really iconic, you know, it's such a British staple, well, world staple. How big is, is the set? Massive, the, the, the actual TARDIS is yeah. massive. I mean, is it, are we talking? Ah, well, no, it's not. Half yeah, this room? Half the room, definitely, yeah. Yeah. The current set's about three stories high as well, so, yeah, it's quite slow. Oh, wow, I didn't say I didn't see all that. <laughs> <laughs> it's changing. Yeah, it's changing. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, so that. Oh, sorry. Do you want me to feed you the line? No, no, no. <laughs> yes, yes. 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 Yes, yes.
Could you just go and have a look at her? How nice it is to be in Chicago. Oh, no, we're not going to. No, um, not just, yet. Yes, it's coming up. It's coming up. Watch this space. Um, what, one of the moments that I remember about working uh, with Matt, which I particularly enjoyed, was um, one day when he had to attack the Dalek um, on set, and they worked us out very carefully with the stunt collar up and all the rest of it, so it really planned out well before we shot it. And he was given two ratchet spanners, quite long ratchet spanners. One was a metal ratchet spanner, which glittered in the light, and the other one was a rubber ratchet spanner. And one of them was the one that he was meant to hit the Dalek with because it would be too bad if you hit the Dalek with. The other one was meant for something else. And you can imagine on the day what happened. Yes, he attacked the Dalek with the wrong ratchet spanner, which made a hell of a gin. And all you could hear inside was, no, no, that's the wrong spanner. <laughs> was reverberating around the Dalek's head, or the operator inside, as he came out of an incredibly dazed. I also learned something about the Daleks as well while I was there, which is that with the operators, if they wanted to have a key, there was a little system that they had with lights. They had flashing lights in a certain area, which were the sort of go lights for distress signals. And quite often, the, the crew, but too occupied, you give an absolute, you know, toss about whether the operator inside needed to have a key. And, and, and they leave her alone, poor little sort. You see little bubbles appearing on the dark. That was oily. That was, yeah. Yeah. Oh, <laughs> yeah. Actually, another bit of logic I remember, which was, which was very nice. I remember we went to go and see, just when I was down filming, it must have been uh, the um, The night before, we had a cast and crew screen on uh, the side of the dark, because people were saying, that. And uh, I was chatting with, with Stephen Moffat and I was like, I've never actually been on the set of dark. Like, really? No, no, I mean, I'm, I'm like, okay. Oh, and, and then the following day, there just been texts. Matt sort of like, sort of went over and tapped me on the shoulder, like, no, just come on with me. And he got the lighting guy, we weren't using that set that day, but he got the lighting guy to light up the entire piece of TARDIS console room set. And it's like, here's my TARDIS, what do you think? And just let me have a play. <laughs> because it's just really nice of him. It was just a very nice, yeah, here's my TARDIS. I'm really proud of it. Yeah, I'm it. So it was just that very sort of nice, generous thing to it. And, and, and Matt is supposed to be quite clumsy. We, uh, obviously, the Spanners uh, story is, is an example of that. Did you, did you, did he bust anything when he was there, breaking off the office? Not as I recall, no, not when I was watching, but no, no. mostly I was just bashing the door myself, so I'm mm -hmm. about a foot and a half wider than you could, so it's usually not going to be very nice at all. Can't throw stones. And neither did you, did you, was he at all clumsy, did you manage to shoot as down? As I say, um, not the clumsy bit, it was the kind of way that it happened, and I think it was just the way that Chucking himself on the floor quite a lot with carrying on stuff. <laughs> They're always scrambling around. Is that a different show? That? Yeah, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> he was on the floor with who at that point? With Karen, Karen, okay. <laughs> By the way, her legs do go all the way up. <laughs> I would uh, bring you slightly back down to Earth for a second and talk about costume. Uh, because you were very, uh, both, all three of you had very different costumes. Uh, I just wanted to talk about the process that you would go through the fittings uh, and, and kind of the background to the costumes. I'll start with Ian, but he was historical. Yes, it was, it was historical. Um, more, it's more to do with the fact that um, I found out that really to make uh, me uh, look good or, or particularly more like church itself. I had to shave my hair, unfortunately. Because my hairline is the which you haven't seen before. Yeah. Yeah. But my hair is anything you don't think is he bald underneath that hat? Is he that's why I wear the hat? No. I've actually got quite a good hair of hair. Hey. 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 <laughs> it's not quite the colour I want at the moment. Can't have I'm gonna try a hair tomorrow. But um so, it 
fact, the hairline of Churchill is further back. Um, and so, in fact, in order to make it look good, I had to shave the head, and then we made a half wig, so it sort of started further back. It did actually look quite good once we had it done. Um, so that was fine, the first time I did it. The second time I did it, um, I was working on Doc Martin. Uh, uh, down in Cornwall, and uh, they gave us some time off to go and do the second uh, of the filming, and I couldn't, have, couldn't, uh, couldn't really go back to Doc Martin and say, oh, hello, I've just done a bit of filming with Doc who and they've shaved my head, because they would have been furious. So the second time around, I had to have a bald wig, which was really quite clever. What they do is they put a, uh, um, they put a latex, uh, um, Cap over your head. It's incredible. I mean, it really does flatten the whole thing down. And then they attach the wig on top of that, which is really why I didn't do that in the first place. I have no idea. <laughs> Quite frankly, the second time around, I think I'll do that. You know, so, you, know, you learn, I would say. It's just really funny because that's what me and Dan are. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> All the time, absolutely. So, I morning. <laughs> Moving along. <laughs> Uh, Nina, because obviously with Melody River, mm. there was a kind of attitude, I mean, you know, from the moment you made your entrance in the sports car, it was, you know, full on. Mm. So with the costume chosen to kind of... Well, yeah, um, I think you think that to <laughs> show the nymph and the sassiness that River, I guess, has and Mel has because she's river. Um, yeah, it was, uh, we, we, we kind of had, you did, I, I went along with the costume designer and I kind of had free reign in picking out a badass costume. Again, story not as, not as exciting. Um, <laughs> so I went, I went shopping. Um, Can I choose the car? I wish I did. <laughs> I didn't get to drive it either. No, but I am. Um, so uh, the dress I chose in one of my favourite shops, and the coat I chose in a shop that I can't afford to shop in. And um, I just had to kind of bear in mind, you know, um, what I might like, Alex might not like, because obviously when we regenerate, and that's the thing we talk. My last line is, "Shut up, Dad. I'm focusing on the dress size." So it's like, <laughs> what dress size she's going to get into? Um, the dress to look good home. I think we both rocked it. You did. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, strangely enough, the songs are about the suit is from Primark. So, uh, <laughs> is it? Yeah, no. Oh. That's been out but uh, no, so the, 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 there are two delightful costumes like the Sontara. There's the butler costume, which is made of cloth, which is great, um, because clothes made of cloth, there's a clue in the name. They, they fit a lot better than clothes <laughs> made entirely of foam latex, which um, take a lot more getting on to. So, um, so with the prosthetics in the morning, it takes about two and a half hours if I'm wearing the butler suit, but three hours if I'm wearing the blue butler suit, because most of that is getting me into a pair of very snug rubber trousers. With, uh, with a lot of talcum powder and two people to hoist me in and hoist them up. Once they're on, they're definitely on. <laughs> so that's, yeah, it's, it's, it's a delight. But the, the, but the butler suit, I actually had to sort of put part of the costume on to then have the measurements um, for the butler suit to be made sort of customarily. So there was a lady from um, the Welsh National Opera who made sort of like a, the, the shirt collar of the front piece, that sort of thing, and she was going, hang on, is this collar here? It's 80 inches, is that right? <laughs> Really enjoy wearing that blue, blue battle suit that much because every time I put it on, another bit of it falls off. And I'll just say, so like bits of it can tear, and it's just very, very tight. Um, but uh, it looks good on screen, so I can't complain. Excellent. And the, uh, I'm just going to see if there's what sort of, uh, how many questions we're going to have, like the point time until we can get them all in. Anyone want to raise their hands if they've got a question? Yeah, I'm Right. If you want to make your way over to the microphone and form an orderly queue, the doctor will see you. <laughs> <laughs> um, while we're waiting for that to happen in a kind of blankety blank way, um, uh, I wish to uh, just talk about the rehearsal uh, process. How much is there in the modern 
uh, Doctor Who because they used to be obviously used to be rehearsal rooms, that kind of thing. Uh, so what's the process these days? How, how long do you actually get to read the lines, get familiar with the script, rehearsing? Kind of yeah, well, you have the read through first of all, which is at the start of the recording block. But then once you're on the set, it's more or less you go there, you step through the lines, they work out where the camera's going to be, and then you're on. So there's no real rehearsal time. Sometimes there's something specific technically in between takes running up to it. So, like something from one of the stunts or something like that, they had a sugar glass window and to bash through during a bug rule. And so we did step that through, and they only had two of those, so we had to be very particular about it. So if it's something specific like that, if it's just a scene in acting, then it's more like just block it, which is, you know, who's going to stand where, say what, when they're going to move. But then you're kind of, you're kind of in there, so yeah, it's all against the clock. That, yes. That's kind of yeah. And does that, that, that differ to other TV shows? No, no, it's just... <laughs> it's just... Yeah. Um, yeah. Back in the day, we hear from older actors about the glory.